Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Carter from Edged Mindset, a YouTube knife channel that I've been watching through its evolution for about 12 years now. I initially tuned into his content when the knife video landscape was still kind of a barren place, but there his voice rose above the sparse chatter with honest and passionate takes on the knives I wanted to have. Carter's channel has covered other topics in the past, most notably guns, uh, but knives have always been at the core, hence the name Edged Mindset. He features plenty of pricey, exotic, aspirational pieces, mostly folding knives, while remaining relatable with his winning personality and his abiding love for Emerson knives and cold steel. Well, in my mind, this conversation has been years in the making, so let's get into it. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And as always, if you want to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Just go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. Carter, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm super, super excited to be here. I don't get to talk about knives nearly enough to like an actual person. My <laughs> wife, my wife does not care. Nobody at work cares. So it's either just me talking to myself in a camera or this is the first time I really get to talk to somebody. So really oh, excited. Man. Really cool. Oh, that that is the whole genesis of this show. It's yeah, like, yeah. oh boy, how much like I think I've saturated the landscape here with my uh, chatter. I better start talking to people who really it means something to. Um, so you have been uh, doing this a long time and uh, your voice must be very familiar to a lot of people. Uh, you used to go by Juju 1313. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, I never really thought about how to pronounce it, but those letters and the numbers were so familiar to me. Um, I just want to start from the beginning of your channel. How did you get your start? This at, at this time, I just want to remind people there weren't too many people. Uh, nothing fancy, of course. And um, and uh, oh, I his name escapes me all of a sudden. The guy you used to have a banter back and forth with the kind of a skinny dude, uh, cool uh, southern guy, I think. Um, anyway, well, I'll he'll, his name will pop up. But anyway, what was it like at the start for you? Uh, it was just fun. I mean, that's all it was, right? Because the, the concept of like YouTubers and, uh, creators and things it it didn't, it didn't exist at that time. So it was really cool because everybody making content, were doing it because they just wanted to do it and they wanted to talk about the stuff they wanted to talk about. And that, that was it, man. I just started doing videos. Thanks to, uh, Jeff, AKA cutlery lover. He's the one yes. that it wasn't even so much that I like loved his stuff that much it was more i saw what he was doing and i was like i think i can do that i can do that i'm just gonna start i'm just gonna start doing that so he's the one that um kind of got me doing it and metal complex is the guy that kind of brought me back uh, a couple of years ago because i left for like a really decent amount of time wasn't really doing anything and because i'm getting ahead of myself so um yeah uh just I always liked knives, um, always had a passion for them, especially like swords and crazy fantasy knives as a kid, um, martial arts weapons. Uh, I remember when I was like 10 years old, my family couldn't afford to put me in like martial arts classes or anything, but I knew a kid whose family did. And so what he would do is he would take a bunch of us and teach us what he learned in martial arts class, like on a Saturday morning. And you can imagine, because I grew up in a little coal mining town. So I can only imagine the quality of these lessons that are like <laughs> secondhand from some guy in this little town teaching a 10 year old who's not teaching us. But we loved it. We ate it up. He had this uh, this catalog full of like size and swords and throwing stars and all this stuff. And I would just pour over this magazine, wanted to save money to buy some of that stuff. So I've always loved weapons. And when I got older and I could actually buy some of the stuff, I just started collecting it. Um, first, I got into ballast songs because I wanted something I could collect and also like try to learn, you know, mm -hmm. um, 
and that's what brought me to Cutlery Lover because I learned my first like five ballast song tricks off his videos. And then I moved into folders and then I started doing videos and it kind of just took off from there and I just kept kept doing it. So you're, um, as I mentioned before, or maybe I, I didn't quite clearly, but uh, I really kind of uh, got hooked on you. I think it was in your Emerson phase, your first one, mm. I don't know, years back. And um, I got to say, this is funny. I, I'm, I'm only really thinking of this now, uh, but watching your videos and watching you open and close. Uh, and this is the this is the slow roll days, like everything yeah. is a um, watching you open and close a knife kind of taught me how to open and close knives one handed. Not that oh, I wow. didn't, not that I didn't, but, but, uh, the, the pass off from, of, of fingers when you're closing a, uh, a liner lock or a frame lock. I was like, that's, that's how you do it. It was always kind of a little like, but my fingers in the way, you know? So watching your videos and, uh, your videos and others at the time really got me, um, hooked in a weird way um because it's like watching people eat it makes you hungry it's yeah, kind yeah. of a similar thing yeah yeah um man appreciate that that's that's really cool i never really intended to teach anybody anything so that's that's awesome whenever you hear stuff like that i was just trying to have a good time showing the stuff that i liked uh that was way before like the drop shutty days man the idea of a knife drop shutting I think if you had a knife that would drop shut back in those days, people would hate it because they would think it's too dangerous. It's weird how uh, how times change. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm interested. Uh, well, since we're there, and I don't want to forget about that, uh, what do you think of that? How do, What do you think of this uh, evolution? Since, yeah, you were gone for a little while. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I do know that you love uh, uh, washer knives a lot, you know. Uh, but what? how have you taken to the new stuff? Um, for the actual knives, like I, I dig them. It took a minute, right. To like readjust to them. Cause I left doing knife stuff, like right about the time that bearings and drop shut and all that kind of started to really take hold. I mean, it was there before, but it really started to take off. Like right when I left, um, I feel like I missed a, a huge, like critical part of the knife community. So I come back and yeah, there was a lot that was different. Um, and it took me a minute to get used to it and start to appreciate those. But once I did, I, I dig them and I appreciate them for different reasons, uh, compared to like the slow roll washer stuff. Um, I still love my striders. I still like Emerson, but the new stuff's cool too. The biggest thing that I struggled with was the complete abandonment of like the overbuilt big rough <laughs> knives, right? Uh, that's the harder one coming back. I've always struggled with small knives. It's not that I don't like them. Uh, it's just, it's more of a, it's going to sound weird. It's more of a money thing. Like if I'm spending a good amount of money, I feel like I need a lot of material there. I struggle with paying $900 for like a Roosevelt. Uh, just a mental block. It's not that it's not a great knife. I just, I struggle with it. Oh man, I totally get it. I, I totally get it. I mean, my tastes also veer towards the weapony and the large Um but yeah, I, I get it. It's like, well, why doesn't that cost? It doesn't have as much material, shouldn't it be? But, you know, and 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 that's not exactly logical, but that's no. just not that this whole thing isn't exactly logical. Yeah, it's not. And um, and the reason why, like, I really got into knives and why I gravitate towards those kind of larger overbuilt category is because the knives I grew up with are really kind of the knives that are popular now. So the knives I had as a kid, and granted, these were all like super cheap versions, but mm -hmm. traditionals, little tiny folders, um, little flippers, things like that. And so when I got into like higher end, mid-level knives, and I saw these big behemoth things that were completely different than anything I've ever had, it just kind of blew my mind. I had no idea something like that existed. Um, so now that the smaller stuff is back, in fashion, I just kind of feel like that's, those are the knives that I grew up with and I carried when I was really young. So they just don't excite me as much, I guess. Uh, but I definitely appreciate all the craftsmanship, the design, everything, everything involved with those. I think it's great. And I think it's awesome that anybody's into any kind of knife. So I totally support any of this stuff. I think it's great for the scene. And I feel like some of the bigger stuff is kind of gaining popularity again, a little bit like, you know, maybe not mainstream popularity, but some people are starting to pick them up. Like Max Ace is doing a lot of really cool stuff with that. Um, really digging those. 
Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like you've you've run to the refuge of Max Ace and Microtech. I've noticed uh, Microtech has has some good uh, large size knives, um, and they're just so. Oh, there's just something about those knives that are. I don't know. Microtech's just really uh, get me going lately. That's that's my latest little sub collection jag. Um, but uh, so I was doing some research watching your amphibian videos and your and your stitch videos. Um, uh, but yeah, Max Ace, they are really uh, carrying that that torch like proudly. I love them. Yeah, yeah, really funky stuff. Speaking of like Microtech and Max Ace, I think there's a lot of design language similarities. I think really like uh, Max Ace kind of took a lot of the design stuff that Microtech was doing and then applied that kind of more towards like the bigger Strider-esque type knives and kind of created their own thing, which is pretty cool. So, uh, speaking of Strider, Emerson, Chris Reeve knives, um, which I know you've, uh, you've enjoyed also, um, it seems like earlier you were more into the American knives. Now you, you are just kind of more into knives in general. Is that, is that a fair assessment? I've, I've also seen a lot more fixed blades on your channel now. Yeah, it's all over the place. I mean, that's, um, that's one of the things I've struggled with uh, having a YouTube channel and then also being like a passionate enthusiast, it's really hard to kind of mash those two things together because one doesn't really feed the other. Like personally as a knife person, I tend to get into like a really narrow scope of interest. Like I like to support certain brands and I'll go into phases where I am just a strider guy and I want to know everything about them, what they've made, the different variances. I've got my grails in mind. I've got my users but that's not very good for a YouTube channel, or at least if you're trying to get to a broad audience, right? Most people don't want to hear you talk over and over again about the same brand and show the same stuff. Um, so for a while there, I did try to branch out and broaden it. I wanted to feature more knives that would appeal to kind of a greater audience, hopefully, and uh, have a little more variety in my channel. But um, I'm starting to sneak back into my old ways and I'm kind of just, I'm going back on a strider kick and, you know, I don't know. It is what it is. But I think you've already developed a winning recipe. Like I don't, I don't think you need to change anything. And people understand the obsessiveness, and and oftentimes people want to go on that trip with you, whether they're gonna uh, parallel it with their own. Oh man, I'm really into Savivis right now, but um, I'm really digging these Strider videos. I know where he's coming from. Yeah, like I, I would say, like uh, you're you're kind of spelling out what it is. Uh, it is a bit of a you know obsession you get you get really deeply into one thing and um yeah i mean it can it can also get expensive running a channel like that so how, how yeah. do you manage like because i i know that you have some very nice knives on there uh do you borrow knives do you buy knives do, like do you have relationships with makers how does it work for managing your channel uh, most of it is just self-funded, unfortunately. I I have done a few things with some retailers. They sent me some stuff to check out. Um, I received some cheaper knives. Just hey, review this. You know, you can keep it. But I could count that on on ten fingers that that's that that's happened. Um, most of it is yeah, I buy stuff and I sell it. Right. So a lot of people think everything I show on my channel I always have. Most I only have so many at any given time. Um, so my collection isn't super vast because to get new stuff i sell stuff it's not the most efficient way to do it um that's one of the things i've been trying to to fix too is come up with a more reasonable way to keep getting new knives on my channel without sending me into the poorhouse but still working on that yeah yeah especially for um you know the kind of knives you like um yeah. sometimes it's but i do find uh that it's harder to sell the cheaper knives that it's harder to sell the impulse buy knives so i could i could I'll, I'll pick on savivi again i i come in and out of them i'm like man they always have such cool like they they take all the risks with savivi and send cut and then they pass it along up to we oftentimes that's what it feels like anyway yeah. and so i i like the chances they take so let me just buy this and see what it's like and then you end up having a whole bunch of them. It's like you you give them away, you try and sell them, but people don't want to buy them. They're so inexpensive and so good that mm. they can just kind of drop it in their Amazon cart, get a brand new one. And I don't know. That's that's maybe that's uh, just 
the justification of someone who wants to hold on to everything. Uh, do you do you find it hard to part with some of these knives? Uh, not not too much. I do have a lot of knife regret though, because I kind of like I mentioned before, I'll bounce around between interests, and uh, you know, I was into Microtex really hard, like I don't know, a year ago or something. Um, but then once I kind of get out of it and move into something else, I don't have a problem selling those off until the next time I get back into Microtech and I'm like, why did I <laughs> yeah. sell those? I had like yeah. so many awesome pieces. And I think back to a lot of the knives I used to have. Um, I had some really cool stuff and I regret selling them, but I just got to remember, yeah, I can pick on the, the ones I shouldn't have sold, but there's a bunch that I definitely should have sold and I do not have any regrets selling. Um, so it's, you know, it's a give and take. You just, you can't keep them all. I just, yeah. you know, just do what you can. So where do you stand on customs? Um, you, uh, seems like sometimes you're, uh, you're forking out custom funds for some of the like high end production stuff you might be showing. Um, do, do you have a feeling one way or another about custom knives? Um, I, I struggle with customs to be honest, especially lately. Um, I I've seen so many issues people have had with placing orders with custom makers. It makes me leery to try to do that. Um, I've seen a lot of well-respected custom makers that I, I looked up to, um, go through hard times and, and kind of things go south and their name gets tarnished and it's, it's just a bad deal. So I kind of struggle on that front. Um, and then I'm also generally just really picky with the machining and craftsmanship of the knife. And with the way that modern production machining is going now, it's like it's so spot on and perfect. It, yeah. it used to be that custom knives were the, the best way to get the best finishes, the cleanest production, things like that. But it's kind of switched now. It's, it's a weird it's a weird situation we're in um, where machining has gotten so good and so precise that it's kind of beating the hand built stuff uh, in a lot of ways. But um, I don't know, man, I could talk forever about the custom stuff because it's changed so much. Like back in the day, when I say back in the day, I'm talking like, you know, 2010 to 2000, whatever, 16 or so. Mm -hmm. Custom knives were like crucial to the knife hobby because that's where all of the latest stuff was coming out of. You yes. know, this was when Spyderco didn't do fra titanium frame locks. Like you, you couldn't buy those product from production, large production companies. Like if you wanted that kind of style, acid stone washing and titanium and anodizing and um, all that stuff, it was all coming out of the custom side. And if it proved itself in the custom knives, enough people were into it, then it would trickle down into the production knife companies and then start making them. That's where like early ZT came from, things like that. Lock bar inserts, uh, bearings and knives that all came from the custom industry and then made its way into the production world. And I don't know if I'm just disconnected. I just don't see that kind of innovation so much anymore, which is, which is sad. Um, I feel like kind of the custom part of the knife community is kind of shrinking, uh, which I don't love, but um, I'm obviously not doing anything to support it either per my own admittal. So. That's, that's interesting. I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but, but I think you're right about that. That is where everything was coming out of. And then yeah. it got, it got <clears throat> absorbed into uh, manufacturing, which is obviously evolving at the same time and can take it and do it better. It's kind of like what AI is going to do with us uh, <laughs> right, right here soon. Um, but take, taking, taking that, uh, oh, ball bearings, great idea. Oh, micro milling, awesome idea. And let's put it into these like trillion dollar machines and, and watch what it can do. Um, and, and we'll sell it to you for 200 bucks. Um, that's, that's the other thing, the, um, the, just the cost differential, uh, now between customs and, um, uh, and, uh, these high-end Chinese, and I'm talking about folders right now. And, and I must admit, I have experience with uh, fixed blade customs, but really very, very little experience with folders. Oh, really? With, with custom folders? Yeah. Yeah. So, that's, uh, that, that's always been kind of my jam. I'm, I'm just barely now trying to make myself get into fixed blades, sort of. I mean, I'm enjoying it, but you know, I'm really kind of pushing to say, I got to check this world out. Cause I've been in the folder world so long. It's like all I ever cared about. So uh, now what do you look for in a, in a folder? Like uh, 
and we've talked about brand loyalty. I don't like to say it like that because I don't feel like it's that. You get obsessed with with uh, with a maker's style and build quality and all that kind of stuff. Um, but but what do you look for generally in a knife? What's your wheelhouse, quote unquote? Something interesting. I mean, something funky, something not boring. And that's kind of my whole life. Uh, all around, I, I like things with bright colors, crazy design choices. I like things that take risks. Um, that's what, what catches my eye. Uh, a lot of people, you know, will say, well, that's gas station-y, that's cheap, that's gaudy. I get it. I get it. I like gas station knives too, though. Like I've, I've, I've been in gas stations where I see a knife and I'm like, Man, if that was Magna Cut, I would be totally buying that right now. Like, I'll take that dragon handle, sign me up. That's awesome. Um, that's that's usually what it is. And I, I try to, because I get a lot of criticism for that on my videos, right? Um, all the time. Gas station knife, you know, that's, that's cheap. That's garbage. What are you going to do with that thing? Um, but I kind of just, I just roll with it now. It, it, it is what it is. That's what I'm drawn to. Anything bold with a strong design language, bright colors, things like that, that kind of catches my eye. Yeah. The, um, I noticed, uh, while Jim was just scrolling on your page, the Midgard messers, uh, you've got some of those, uh, German, German behemoths, yeah. uh, I, uh, for me, like that's a, that's a bridge too far for me, but, uh, a knife like that, for instance, or we were talking before you have a Phil Harvey, uh, an amazing knife, but, but not your average pocket knife. Um, do you carry all of these? No, but not because I have some aversion to it. I just, I have too many. Um, and I, I physically can't, and I guess it depends on your definition of carry. So I've worked from home for the past like three years. So I only leave like the house a handful of times during the week. So I carry knives around the house um, and I swap them out like all day. You know, I'll just grab a couple. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm on a, I'm on a work call or something. I'm playing with them and then I put them back and I grab some other ones, uh, go for a walk around the park, grab a knife, take some photos of it, that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, when I do leave the house, I do carry just about everything. There are a few really expensive ones that I kind of hold on to as, you know, I just want to leave them untouched mainly because if I do need to sell them, I want to make sure I can get you know, as much out of them as I can. Uh, but I do try to, uh, carry everything that I have. What do you, what would you tell someone, um, who's tempted because, you know, we can really kind of go down our own rabbit holes with this, but what would you tell someone who's tempted to be irresponsible in order to get some of these, uh, prestige knives or uh the kind of knives we aspire to have aspirational knives uh just be smart about it like that that's what it is and if you can't be smart about it then just don't don't do it know know what the resale value is buy it at that or below and then you'll be good right because i mean that's that's how my whole channel was like even if you go back to the original like i had a mixed strider damascus blade with the damascus front scale that i had i bought that knowing full well i can't keep the thing i had no business having it but i knew i could get it i could check it out i could do some videos take some pictures and then i could sell it and get my money back um so if you if you think of it more and this is going to sound weird but if you think of if you think about it more like the stock market right you're trading fiat currency for a physical asset the physical asset has a value that's deemed um, according to the marketplace. And as long as that's a fair trade and any money that you lose when you exchange that again for fiat currency, you're, you're willing to accept, then you're good. It's not that big a deal. That is a, yeah, yeah. That's a clean way of looking at it. And, and if you can do that, um, more power to you. Uh, I find them difficult to sell. Uh, first of all, uh, like unreliable in terms of where I sell and whether, mm -hmm. whether they're going to sell, but also what do I have? Is it, is it, what, what am I willing to part with is more the the thing. And is that the really desirable stuff that people are going to buy? Um, that's that. And then you end up with hundreds of knives and, uh, you know, eventually there's gotta be a reckoning and, a and, a. It's so I'm now uh, you're my therapist because I'm just like talking about I, I really do have to have to get rid of some some stuff. And uh, for a while, I was treating it like a museum, like you said. Yeah. 
anything interesting like oh oh i don't have this lock well do you need that lock are you going to carry it or no one's coming and paying admission to check out this lock you're not going to use um i i've run into a bit of that um tell me about like what you see in terms of trends that okay you you were talking about uh, Juju 1313, you stopped for a while. Uh, you came back, you did some other stuff, some pew pews and some uh, snakes or working out stuff. You did a lot, a lot of different I, stuff. I did some snake stuff. Yeah, that was an old, old hobby I was into. My wife, uh, she put a, an end to that though. So I'm, <laughs> that's no longer allowed. I feel the pull every once in a while, but I'm like, nah, that one's a, that one's a tough one though. It's a, it's a messy hobby. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm cool with staying away from that. The pew pew stuff. I've actually kind of really made an effort to just separate myself from that recently. So I've gotten rid of all of that content on my channel, um, which, you know, I've, I've made the mistake of kind of mixing uh, content on this channel way too many times. I've flip flopped and it's always been a little bit of a messy thing every time I, I transition from one hobby to the other. So finally I'm doing it the right way. And I'll do a different channel for that content and keep this one, the original channel, solely knife focused is the is the goal now. So when you were um, not producing content, uh, were you still collecting knives? Were you still thinking about them and uh, kind of engaged the same way and just not documenting it? <laughs> no, not really. I, I really kind of just got out of the whole thing. Um, and you know, I, I had a young family, youngish family at the time I was busy. I was trying to focus on career. I was trying to went on a health kick, you know, the, the mid thirties health kick, mm -hmm. um, doing that a lot, but I, I held on to a few knives, but most of them I sold. Uh, unfortunately, I wish I hadn't done that, but yeah, I sold a lot of them and kind of really distanced myself. I'm still wondering exactly why. I don't know why. I don't know exactly why I did that. Um, but yeah, I really kind of just washed my hands of the whole thing and stepped away for some reason. Huh. So what, what, uh, inspired you to come back, um, in different forms? Um, usually what it is, is it's, uh, it's freaking YouTube, man. Um, I remember like with the, the pew pew stuff, I, I had bought a new one. That I, and I hadn't bought anything in a long time. I bought a new one and just the thought popped in my head, hey, you should do a video unboxing this thing. You haven't made a video in like two years. You might as well. Why not? Um, and so I did. And for some reason, that video blew up. And then, of course, I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I got to keep going. This, this is great. You know, this is the ticket. And, and of course, none of the other videos did very well. Um, but here's the I, I tend to go overboard when I get into these things. And that's usually what causes me to kind of step back and get away from it. Um, because I kind of need to say, you got to cool your jets. And YouTube kind of enables me sometimes because it gives you that extra urge of like, I should get that thing that would make a good video. If I get this thing, I could compare it to this one. And that's good uh, content, yeah. you know? And yeah. it just gives you that little extra push to maybe do things you shouldn't really do. And, uh, so sometimes I, uh, I just have to say, I gotta, I gotta step away for a little bit. Interesting. Yeah. It's like a, uh, dopamine hit a little dopamine. Oh, did you see how many it's only been up for four hours? What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You think yeah, you I've, finally cracked the code and then yeah. it ends up not being the case. It's funny. I've experienced that a, a couple of times, uh, never gone viral or anything like that, but I've had a couple of videos that have, uh, you know, oddly blown up. Like really that one? you know um have just blown up weirdly like that um so when you returned to knives knives uh you were re-engaging with knives they were a new hobby again uh, mm -hmm. what did you see a in the night well we'll get to that in a second but what did you see in terms of knives in terms of trends in terms of things besides fall shut uh and bearings that were exciting and new that that you kind of missed out on their uh advent um oh yeah that's that's a that's a good one um i mean kind of like you mentioned before a lot of the the chinese companies uh what they're they're producing both in terms of designs and quality really blew me away a lot of the collaborations with these companies uh with we um seeing knife makers so like christensen I'll just pick on him, Christensen Knifeworks, right? Seeing him do collaborations with like 
we with the what is it the thug xl is that the one he did with them um i remember watching him when he was just grinding scales in his bedroom and he had the grinder set up to blow it out the window and and that's what he was doing he was he was what they used to call pimping knives i I don't think they call it that anymore i think it's like just customization but and then to see him to come back and see him doing collaborations like really cool designs as well as his own kind of custom knife career uh that just blew me away um seeing all the new youtubers too all the new channels you know neves knives uh metal complex like i mentioned before like none of these people were around when I left, or at least if they were, they weren't on my radar. I wasn't watching them. So um, that was really cool. And then as far as trends, kind of like I said earlier, it was actually a little more of a slight disappointment. And some of the stuff I loved was now not only popular, but like kind of made fun of, (laughs) you know, that was a little (laughs) hard pill to swallow, but I'm okay with it now. I I just like what I like and it is what it is. And, and those kind of knives always have a special place like in my mind, just because when I when I got in, right, and there's the, I try to run away from it and try to get into the new stuff a little bit more, which I am. Don't get me wrong. I do like the new stuff. I do like smaller knives. They just aren't the same as kind of the the stuff that I came up with. It, it's just always going to be what I think of as a cool knife. Yeah, your old boomer knives. You're you're a royal triumvirate, right? The Chris That's Reed, what it is. Yeah, Strider, and uh, I always put Emerson down there as a duke below them because I've always loved uh, Emerson knives and <clears throat> and the designs and the you know everything behind it. Have you um, seen what, uh, what Lucas is doing? His oh, son. Yes, I have. That is so cool. I'm really hoping he kind of carries that torch with the company. As do I. I. I've I've only really seen or paid attention to. Uh, his folding kukri it's yeah. a flipper and it looks like you know it looks just like an emerson uh, yep. i gotta say uh, or or a family resemblance we'll say oh for sure yeah he's he's taken all that you know the classic design language and he's just hopefully moving forward with it um i thought uh forest was going to do that for strider knives but i i'm not so sure uh, i'm not familiar uh was strider went through some strange um reconfiguration a few years back and yeah uh, i think they declared that they were closed and then they were, were back opened in a different form or something do you, can you actually uh clear that up do you have any insight on that yeah i'll do my best i don't have you know super so any, if any of this is wrong like don't kill a messenger but for as i understand it Dwayne dwyer and mick strider started strider knives incorporated ski so that was the company that kind of everybody knew that was producing production Strider knives. Then at some point, I think 2016, they decided to dismantle the company and go their own separate ways. Uh, The exact reasoning behind that, I've heard different things. Some of it I've heard is just a logistic thing. It was just too much to run that kind of a business at that scale and that Mick and Dwayne couldn't do their own custom stuff. And they kind of missed just making knives themselves and then I've also heard that maybe they had a falling out. I don't know exactly why, but they they kind of split up. And so Mick just went off and did Mick Strider custom knives and started producing stuff under the kind of performance moniker, which was being done right before Strider Inc. disbanded anyways. And then Dwayne took off and he's doing his own custom knives, which they're both still doing today. Uh, but then somewhere along the line, uh, over the last few years, the Mick Strider custom knives side started to do kind of retro knives, if you want to call them. So producing kind of the old, oldish style knives that they used to do under SKI, mm-hmm. uh, now branded as M Strider instead of Strider. So there's some differences, uh, probably legally. Uh, but yeah, that's that's as I understand it, how things got to where they are now. Okay. Okay. I know the last uh, couple of you've gotten a couple of new striders recently and and that's uh, i want to talk about that really cool one you just posted with the compound grind and those kind of veth like serrations but uh strider is one of those companies there there are a lot like there's a new guard and there's an old guard and we're kind of straddling those uh uh in terms of eras right now Mm -hmm. um and uh and i'm talking about knife youtubers here uh and and there are some who still like the striders the emersons the uh, you know, the, the, the older knives we're talking about, or the, you know, which ones I'm talking about the pantheon of the of boomer, classics. Knives. Yeah, the boom, the boomer knives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, yes. Okay. And then there are the ones who like the fancy colorful fall shutty knives, um, which by the way, I love too. I mean, it's, if it's got steel, I'm, I'm into it, uh, basically, but, um, 
so uh, do you find that coming out with that kind of content right now is it falls on more deaf ears than some of the other stuff you've put out? Like, say, when you talk about microtech, which is sort of perennially popular. Uh, yes and no. I would say if I featured kind of the, the new guard stuff, as you mentioned more, I would I think I would pull in a larger audience ultimately. But a lot of the people that subscribe to me are the people that appreciate like the Striders and the Emersons and things like that. So, so yes and no, if I publish a video, it seems to do about the same, honestly, for the most part. Um, if I do newer stuff or if I do like Strider stuff, it's just different audiences of my subscriber base connect with it uh, differently than the, the other side, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I get that. Um, I, I, just I cover so many different uh, kinds of like the weapons on the wall to to slip joints to everything that I'm always kind of like, who's watching this? Like I, I, ha I must have a very random smattering uh, as opposed to to some channels that are really focused and and really excel because they're focused on, you know, <clears throat> one type of knife, uh, yeah. you know, modern folders or whatever. Um I've been really excited about the uh, modern slip joints. Uh, I have been yeah. for a couple of years. Uh, is is that on your radar in terms of something you're interested in uh, digging into at all? Um, a, a little bit. I, I got into traditionals years and years ago. Um, and then once again, when I came back and I saw kind of this modern interpretation of them, I was like, that's freaking genius. Like that is the smartest move ever. What a smart idea. Um, I haven't gotten a ton, um, probably because I, I had a vampire jack and it gave me the worst cut of my entire life. Like, right. I've got it on video. Um, it's nasty. And it happened like four months ago and it hit me right in the knuckle, it, like karate chopped right in my knuckle hmm. and my knuckle still isn't right. Like it still swells up every morning. I can't close it. It's swollen and painful. Like, so I'm because sorry, of, I just laughed at your misfortune there. <laughs> because of that, I'm like, no more modern slip joint. No, um, I just haven't really jumped back into them too much yet, but I think they're, they are pretty cool. And what a smart idea, like genius idea. Um, and some of the custom makers doing slip joints again oh, is so yeah. cool. So beautiful. I'm so glad that they kind of uh, are getting their, their time in the spotlight again. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, um, to me, they go hand in hand with the overbuilt knives, uh, that I like, uh, they go hand in hand with the fixed blade knives. I like to carry a fixed blade too. Uh, I, I love the slip joints, uh, especially in terms of small knives. I mean, um, I do like small mod, like you mentioned the, Ro the Roosevelt. I, I had that on loan for a short while. It was incredible. I mean, it was amazing, but I, I knew that if I had that, I probably wouldn't carry it. If it's small, it's got to be a slip joint and I'll carry it. Everything yeah. else is, you know, more generous, generously uh, proportioned. Um, something else that uh, is new um, is influencer knives. And I'll just I'll say that I, I don't like the word influencer. It's a little broad, but knife guy knives, uh, knives designed by guys like you and me who mm. learn CAD and then have there's uh, companies over there in China producing them um, every once in a while, something made over here. Uh, that's kind of a, an interesting leveling of the playing field and, and such. What do you think about all that? I think ultimately, I think it's really, really cool. Um, there are some, you know, there's some annoying things about it, but I, when I first saw that and I heard that that was happening, I thought how amazing that people with really smart ideas and designs are no longer be held to like having machining background, having access to these things, right? Like in most industries, the idea is that you focus on what you can contribute the most with. And so if you, if you can't do that, if you're not a machining guy, you outsource it to somebody who is the best machinist. So from that standpoint, I think it makes total sense. Why should an artistic designer be somebody that knows how to operate heavy machinery or why should that be the default? But on the other hand, it does create a lot of noise. Like it seems like everybody's doing it and they're all very much the same. And there's not as much excitement about it. 
Um, every time I pop into Instagram, I feel like I run across somebody else who's doing it and more power to them, you know, if, if, if it can take off and become popular. Uh, but it does kind of dilute a little bit of the specialness of, of new designs, in my opinion, compared to how things used to be, because there was a, a much higher uh, barrier to entry to to make knives, whereas that's kind of been reduced lately, it seems like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, definitely has been reduced, and um, I'm not I'm not thinking of anything in particular because um, the people I'm thinking of, I I like them all, but it it opens the door for a dilettantish, if that's a word, design. It, yeah. it opens the door for it, like uh, just kind of a a lame design that uh, that is um, manufactured and engineered over there. Uh, you know, like. Uh, I don't know how we can make this ugly design a uh, functioning knife, but we will figure it out and we will send you a prototype. Um, it opens the door to that. Now, uh, that said, it's an expensive process, so I would imagine um, people don't go about it that way. And like I said, the ones I can think of are all actually really good and they're enthusiasts who use knives and so they know how to design. Yeah. Or they know what they want out of a design. But um, I got to admit, the very first time I, I, I've, I experienced that or saw that come across. I was like, who do they think they are? Like, <laughs> yeah. They like knives. And then I was like, oh, well, that's actually pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. What I want to know is if I design a knife on bronze phosphor washers with no lock bar insert, can I get somebody to make that knife overseas? I don't need, I don't even know. Like, is it like a, a default that no, if you're gonna have a knife made by us, it has to be on bearings and it has to have a lock bar insert and it has to have a ceramic ball detent. I'm curious if if anybody would take on that challenge. I, I gotta say, I think you know who I think would, and oh. because they did is best tech. And oh, I'll, really? I'll I'll tell you what I know about this. Uh I, I got this knife that I saw on um the recommendation of he, he now goes by his uh, brand, Luck Knives. He he actually makes the knives, but he was NAF sergeant a little while ago, and he he um, just collected cool knives, and he uh, declared, you know, I discovered a, a, like a new like American handmade knife. I was like, what is this? And I watched it, and it was so cool, and I ordered it called the Mekong Delta Combat Folder uh, <laughs> by, by, Mong or by uh, Gooseworks. That's part of Resco Instruments bunch of frogmen who make watches and then they make these knives and i put frogmen in quotes i didn't mean to they are uh that but it's part of the branding that's so cool you know the yeah. world barefoot frogmen in our basement making knives that's what i thought and then and then uh later on discovered it was made by best tech but but they made a knife that has uh, and i have it over there i wish i uh, i'll show it to you when we're done rolling here but they made a knife that actually has the feel of like a, you know, Strider meets Chris Reeve knives meets oh. Spartan. Um, and uh, it's hard to get because you have to order it through Resco instruments and they only have a limited amount. And then I, I think they do runs, but my point is the news is good. I think, I think that they are willing to do anything and, and best tech, I think they just knock it out of the park every time. I've got to check that one out. Um, yeah. I'm very interested in that. I, I would kind of like to see a swing back to that. And that, that reminds me of like when you asked about the things that I've noticed that's different from like the old guard and the new guard. Aside from just sizes and popularity and materials and things like that, probably the biggest shift that I've noticed is a change from being like ideology focused and company focused into manufacturing focused. Like back in the, the Hinderer Emerson days, when you got into those brands, it was above and beyond just the object, right? It kind of represented things that you connected with and vibed with in terms of what the company stood for, how cool the people were, if you liked them, if you liked their styling and what they stood for. Um, they they created a whole almost mythos, especially like Ernest Emerson, right? And all of his his knife fighting and uh, motivational stuff. Like it was, it was above and beyond just the knife. And it seems like now that's gone, right? Now it is just the object and how well that object is made and manufactured is kind of what people prize the most. How tight are the tolerances? How well is it done? How thought out is where the placement of the detent ball is so that you don't get that double step when you close it? That kind of stuff seems to be uh, the, the bigger focus. And neither one's right or wrong. It's just it's just different. You know, that, that was a big change that I kind of noticed. 
Yeah, and and that's kind of a cold. Uh, I, I shouldn't compare it, but there's there's a there's something a little more humanistic and warm about the the first scenario uh, you outlined, and something calculating and materialistic about the second. But I mean, we're paying money. We should expect a certain uh, you know yeah. amount of engineering and performance and design and all that. I'm not saying that, and I I I am also similar to that though. I find myself, as I mentioned before, as a sentimental knife collector, uh, going more a lot for story and how a design strikes me emotionally. Yeah. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Um, so, uh, in in the in the interim, uh, when you were not uh, so much into knives, um, and you were into uh, the pew pews, as we mentioned before, um, I, I wanted to ask you: Do you have any particular a favorite from that realm uh, that I don't know. I'm always, I'm always kind of interested in that as well. Um, the, in terms of like style or classification. Yeah. yeah. Um, AKs. AKs were always my favorite thing ever. Um, and honestly it was me and the pew pew world didn't always jive the best because my appreciation for them were derived mainly from their history, their design, the engineering, um, that kind of stuff, as opposed to necessarily the practical use of them. I, I shot, but that was never my primary driver. So like with, with the AK 47s, I got enamored with the history of the early ones that came into the country uh, produced once again, you know, speaking about China, right? Some argue the very best, highest quality AKs ever produced came from China. But when they first came over, nobody wanted them. They were considered to be the bad guy gun. Um, mm. Nobody bought them. And now they're highly sought after, super collectible. And there's a whole slew of these kind of things. And there's uh, within the AK community, there's a huge drive to get as close as you can to the original Izmosh uh, Russian made ones. And so a lot of people like the ones made in um uh where um i can't remember but uh because they use the original like machining and tooling that was borrowed from the russians and that kind of thing so once again similar to how i i get really small scoped and into something i just absolutely love that world because learning about every single importer that ever happened with this <laughs> mark and then it came in here and don't buy these ones because they had a bad heat treat and um, so I just really love that whole kind of collector scene there. So how does the that collector scene compare with the knife collector scene? It's uh, pretty similar. They're just harder to buy and sell. I mean, that's... Oh, yeah, right, sure. You know, a lot more hoops to go through to to get those. You can't just uh, throw them on a Facebook group and say, send me a PayPal and we'll we'll trade. You know, yeah. it's a lot harder to, like, move and get new things. But other than that, it's very similar. Um, they're after the same type stuff, right? They're after the unique things. This one has this marking. This one has that marking. This one's made here, so it's more money, and they bid on it. And uh, it's a whole entire world, especially when you're looking at, like, 80s and 90s rifles that, that were coming in. Yeah, I bet uh, with the money involved, too, it probably makes knives uh, look like the the junior partner because uh, – yeah, I've I've always I've had to remind my wife from time to time just be glad I don't collect guns or cars, you know. We'd be in the poorhouse now. Yeah. You know. It's um ah man, knives can get pretty pricey. Uh for sure they absolutely can. That's another thing that's always interesting though whenever I feature either of those knives or QPs, how people automatically draw correlations between the two. Um, a lot of people view yeah. knives as like an inferior version of a pew pew. And I, I never understood why those two things were ever compared. Like if I have an expensive knife, you know, some of the top comments is I could get this pew pew for that, or I could get two of those. And I'm like, yeah, you could buy a leather couch too. I mean, there's a lot of things you could do with that money. And if, if you need to do that, then yeah, do that first and then come back to the knife. If you want it, if you don't want it, then just, you don't, don't get it. Um, but yeah, time and time again, that's a huge comparison people make. Uh, well, the interesting thing, if you look at, uh, say, Knife Rights, uh, Doug Ritter's organization, they've gone from, let's see, they've changed uh, the laws in like 36 states, my own state included, uh, where I, I couldn't carry or own an automatic or sell it or make it or mm. do anything with an automatic knife. Now I can hide it on my person. Uh, uh, but he, uh, it's just in talking to him about that comparison, 
you know, because people will compare knife rights to the NRA also. And, um, you know, like, oh, it's the NRA for knives. And, and he kind of takes exception to that uh, in a way. But but he was saying it's a it's a very different topic because he can really um, uh, make connections across the aisle, like uh, because everyone kind of grows up or, or so far anyway everyone has kind of grown up with pocket knives, you know, uh, bombing around in the woods, whatever, you know, most people who grew up as, you know, from kids had pocket knives and, and they're mm-hmm. sympathetic to that. Um, you know, you might, you might go to a, a Democrat Senator and say, look, it's about pocket knives. Uh, he said that so many times uh, the the people who would have uh, turned down anything about guns would say yes to knives because uh, they see that they're, isn't a strong correlation. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, I've always thought of knives primarily as cutting tools. Um, I love the, the concept of, of self-defense with knives, but more of kind of like an art form type thing. I would, I would never really consider that a first line objective with knives. Obviously if that's all you got, that's all you got. But um, I've always considered them cutting tools first and foremost, wanting to separate one thing into multiple things. Uh, I do have a speed round uh, we're going to get to, uh, but b- before we get to the speed round, I want to talk about you. You said you're, you're trying to get uh, fixed blades more into your life. And, and yeah. I sensed it's a little bit of an effort, but you like them and everything. Uh, well, you know, you have the Jed Hornbeak um, and I have the the Necromance, one of, one of three that w- were made when the one that you were checking out was made. And um I am crazy in love with this knife. So um, good. Wh- how about this guy? You know, Jed Hornbeek. He's amazing. He is. Um, honestly, he's the reason why I decided to check out fixed blades. Like time and time again, people are yelling at me, you know, full tang or nothing, get fixed blades. <laughs> Folding knives are already half broke. You know, I've been hearing that so much. Um but it was Jed Hornbeak. And I'm trying to think of where I came across this stuff. It might've been just Instagram that I, that I first saw his stuff. And then later I saw your uh, podcast with him. Mm. Um, But yeah, so, so cool. Like I really, really like his stuff. It's like that, in my opinion, it's the perfect mix of like utilitarian usability, but it's got enough flair to it. It's got enough cool, stuff going on and then he also offers different variances of it right like you can get he does some pretty funky stuff but then he also does some some pretty uh utilitarian traditional type stuff too um but i was blown away by just the quality like yes really well done yeah it's 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 very hard to um show it in a video and express it i mean the way it feels in hand um and and yeah the quality of it and it's not CNC. I mean, it's milled, but it's like hand milled. I don't know what you call it, but non CNC mm-hmm. milled my, manual mills. Like this guy is very, very talented and he's, uh, you know, I, I just wish he could make more, you know? Yeah. And, uh, in my opinion, his stuff is, uh, underpriced. So if you want it, everybody oh, yeah. go out and snag it. Cause I think it's, I don't think you're going to be able to get it as easily in the future. I, I think I tend to agree with you on that. And, and he already, you know, as he said on on the inter- within the interview I had with him, it's not like he makes big batches of things. He makes mm-hmm. small, like very small batches, and he rarely revisits a design. Which is, you know, th- there are some that are current are, that are ongoing models, but frequently he's just like, no, I'm done with that. And like I, I'm panicking. Like I want him to make more of these because uh, I want I want one in a longer blade size. Also, uh, but anyway, uh, yes. I, I'm very excited about him, and I, it was cool to see that you have the Ma- Malvern. What's it called? Uh, I have the the Mall Cop. I have the the Necromancer and Mall Cop. Yeah, M A U L. What a clever name! Uh, and then I have another one too. Uh, I cannot remember the name of it, so I have three of his three of his knives. Okay. Oh, so you do have this one, the chisel yes. ground? Yeah, yep, with the, the holes on one. the side. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to figure out what those seven holes were like. Yeah. Uh, what what they they must symbolize something but yeah possibly the other uh the other new fixed blade maker that i'm really digging is savage creature um i, f- I forget the maker's name roger pearson i think is his name under the brand savage creature um and he's doing like completely different style than uh jed hornbeak but um he does more in the kind of tracker dan blood shark kind of mm-hmm. style mm-hmm. 
but very Japanese katana inspired. So it has like a katana wrap on the handle, but still ultimately just very simple kind of dark heavy metal inspired type stuff. Really cool. Um, I'm hoping to get a, a video up on some of his stuff here soon. I just haven't yet. Didn't, uh, don't you have a picture on your Instagram of a Pekal style knife by him? I do. Yep. That's one of yeah. his. Yep. Oh. Um, out of the three I have though, the other two are, are much cooler than that one. Oh man. Well, okay. That looks cool to me at, I'm a sucker for a Pekal, a well-designed Pekal knife, and I absolutely love Sukamaki wrap. I think it's one of the the best grips out there. You don't need a guard. Yeah. I exactly. guess if you have a guard, that's even better. But yeah. All right. Uh, so Carter, I like to end uh, all of my interviews with with uh, people who have knife channels with this speed round. So we really get to you know get the full cut of your jib here, uh, just in 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 a one word answer. It's about twenty questions. Uh, are you ready, sir? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's go. All right. Fixed or folder? Oh, folder. Flipper or thumb stud? Thumb stud. Washers or bearings? Washers. Tip up or tip down? Oh, I struck tip up. Tip up. I want to be the cool tip down guy, but I'm, I'm tip up. <laughs> uh, Tonto or Bowie? Bowie. Warncliffe or drop point? Drop point. Hollow ground or flat ground? Ooh. Oh, I, uh, flat. Yeah. Huh. I won't hold it to it, but I got uh, full size or small. Full size. Gentleman's knife or tactical knife? Tactical. Okay. Out the front or out the side? Out the front. 100%. All right. Cold steel or Emerson? Oh, why you got to do that? That one's, <laughs> that one's not cool. Uh, Ah, uh, I have to go Emerson. Barely, barely. Gotcha. Max Ace or Microtech? Microtech. Milled titanium or spring clip? Oh, uh, let's go milled. Carbon fiber or micarta? Micarta. Button lock or crossbar lock? Ooh, crossbar. Finger choil or no choil? Troil, baby. <laughs> Custom or production? Oh, man. Production. I think production. Form or function? Form. I'm going to get so much crap for that, but yeah, yeah it's hey, form for me. I'm, I'm, I'm right here with you. It's an unpopular stance. It and is. last, your desert island knife. One knife for the rest of your life. I'd have to go with a, even though I said production, I'd have to go with a uh, Mixed Rider Custom XL. Mix Strider Custom XL. Very nice. Well, that's, you know, but it also kind of looks like a production knife we're all familiar with. Yeah. Uh, so that, uh, that almost, that almost is keeping with, uh, with both of your okay. philosophies. Okay. All right. I like that. So uh, out the front, I was a little surprised by, and uh, I was wondering where you'd go with Cold Steel or Emerson. That is that, a hard one that I would that never want to so be asked. Tough. Yeah. That, that's a dirty question to ask somebody. That's a tough one. It is because it's like two two of your favorite uncles started yeah. a knife company, you know, and <laughs> your crazy uncle Lynn and your centered uncle. <laughs> no, uh, Lynn Thompson, by the way, super cool guy. I, I yeah. finally had a chance to meet him, and man, that was an experience. Uh, as has this. I've, I've it's been a real pleasure meeting you and yeah. talking with you, Carter. And uh, um, yeah, it's cool to put a face to a to a voice. Uh, at long last and uh, I, I look forward to you know keeping up the conversation absolutely awesome thank you for having me man it's been fun uh, it's my pleasure take care yep There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Carter from Edged Mindset uh, on YouTube and on Instagram. Uh, do check him out. You'll be happy you did. Uh, not only really great close-up, uh, inter uh, not interviews, uh, close-up videos of really, really cool knives, the kind of compelling stuff we've been talking about, but also really great shorts uh, that you definitely uh, 
short videos, you know, YouTube shorts that you want in your feed because they're awesome and they're frequently pretty damn funny. So check them out. That's Carter at Edge Mindset. Also, be sure to check out Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives, our live stream, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.